In this episode, we dive into the world of luxury e-commerce and fashion with our guest, Abigail Joseph. Imagine this, we're chatting with Abigail while she's surrounded by the beautiful desert in Scottsdale, Arizona. She's going to talk about her time with amazing brands like Forever 21 and Jacques Marimage and her take on the latest trends in digital marketing. In our conversation, we've discussed how brands really stick with customers and how AI is shaking things up in online shopping. Abigail shares insights on maintaining brand DNA, website design, and customer retention strategies. She emphasizes the importance of consistency across channels and the need to focus on customer lifetime value. Abigail also highlights the role of collaborations and partnerships in diving customer acquisition. We've also discussed various topics related to hiring, company culture, the perspective of Gen Z on work, the importance of soft skills in management, and the future of work. Abigail knows her staff, and she's been in the game for long enough to see how things have changed and where they might be headed next. So grab your favorite drink, get comfy, and let's get into this. We've just having a relaxed talk here, sharing some experiences, and maybe learning a thing or two along the way. Here we go. Welcome to the Ecom Pulse, your heartbeat to the world of e-commerce. I'm your host, Eitan Kotter. Join us as we meet with industry leaders, marketing experts, and the innovative minds behind the tech that is shaping the e-commerce future. So plug in, gear up, and get ready for a pulse funding journey into the heart of e-commerce. Hi, Abigail. How are you? Hi, I'm well. Nice to see you and speak yes. with you. Nice to see you again. Yeah. How are you? I mean, are we going to jump directly to e-commerce? Are you going to show with us this amazing scenery behind you? Beautiful oh, Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, um, well, we can, we can always do whatever you want, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona right now. And in front of me, I'm staring at the desert and it's beautiful because, you know, this is their rainy season. So the desert turns green and the flowers are blooming and um, it's just really beautiful and serene. The weather's perfect here right now, you know, 70 awesome. during Fahrenheit <laughs> during, during the day, and, yeah. you know, cools down to like fifties at night and yeah, it's lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. Nice. So do you find it more uh, inspirational, increased creativity? Better yeah. for work or more tranquility? You know, you know I, I I feel like it balances me out. Um, in LA, I live right by the water and there's something about the water that is very calming to me. I'm a fire yes. sign. Yes. So maybe I think, you know, the, the elements <laughs> of water and fire. Yeah. Um, but here there's the earth and, and the earth grounds me. And so yes. being able to walk outside barefoot and just kind of stand and look at the desert and at night hearing the coyotes in the background, you know, if we're grilling and nice. And then I was out by the pool and I, I was reading and I looked up and there was a coyote just like feet from me. Wow. Just kind of looked at me and then kept walking. Like, oh, really? Yeah. Stopped and looked at you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and I thought, does that mean something? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, interesting, interesting. So Abigail, I know you I know you are you have many years of experience in e-commerce and obviously did a lot of things. Your latest role also in the luxury, you know, department or luxury yeah. products. Yeah. So I know you have a special and unique perspective of everything that is going on, specifically also with the staffing and next generation of work, Gen yeah. Z. So I mean we have a I think a really interesting topics to discuss today. So where, where do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, we can start with, um, you know, my most recent experience at Jacques Marie Maj, which is mm -hmm. a really incredible luxury eyewear and accessories company there. I mean, uh, Jerome, the founder is now doing this uh, really unbelievable jewelry uh, with, you know, precious, semi-precious stones and his attention to detail is next to it just far outweighs anything I've ever seen uh, in that space. He's 10 years young in his business this year. And I believe that, you know, he will, he will 
continue to grow and expand into other categories and bring his uh, incredible detailed eye in, you know, hopefully into handbags and other, you know, leather goods and, um, you know, maybe one day apparel. Uh, I, I think, wow. I think he'll be um, a mainstay and, uh, and a legacy brand one day. Wow. It's really inspiring to hear from you, you know, such a passion about uh, the business and your confidence in the growth of how it started. It started on the retail side when the e-commerce platform was launched. What's the, what's the background? Yeah, no, he started a wholesale, you know, yeah. uh, business and his, you know, his wholesalers, um, I, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but, you know, from, from what I've learned in the, and, and being at the company, you know, they're very important to the business because they, they really helped him grow and believed in the brand when it was first starting. And eventually, um, you know, there was, uh, there, he launched a website and then when I started there a little over a couple of two years ago, uh, we replatformed and, and launched and, you know, put into place some very strategic digital marketing efforts um, and, and a global launch strategy, uh, which has, you know, grown the business significantly from the e-commerce standpoint. Um, it was really perfect timing, I think. All in all, you know, there's something to say about a founder who has such a vision and belief in a company and and a team around him that he trusts. I think I think if a brand can stay true to their DNA and and always, you know, move forward knowing that is this step true to our DNA? Is this step true to our DNA? Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they can be very successful. Oftentimes a brand will try to become uh, something for everyone. And I don't necessarily know that that's the best thing for the brand because, you know, something gets lost there. Mm -hmm. And then like their core customer base that really helps them grow doesn't recognize them anymore, you know? And, yes. and I think that that's when the customer leaves. Um, but really, you know, going back to the growth, there's, there's been, it's been very on purpose, uh, very strategic. And again, staying true to the, true to the DNA and the quality and craftsmanship. That is, you know, a North, North star. North star. Yeah. The company. I assume that for luxury product, obviously a limited edition, there yeah. are so much, I mean, there are so many, you need to protect the product, protect the brand, right? Not, yes. Right. So yes. how, I mean, I'm sure it's like in every decision, you know, there are, okay, where this product is going to be distributed or visible, who, who is beside my product. I mean, what are the things that are unique to this environment that you had to take into consideration when you launched the platform? You know, the, the voice of the brand and the copy. Right. Um, there's been one person who's written the copy for him since inception. Wow. Um, you know, and and he, uh, his name is Andrew, and he very much knows, you know, Jerome, and, and Jerome trusts him, and I think they have a really good synergy uh, and respect for each other and, and understanding that voice is really important, making sure that that voice is throughout an e-commerce platform and that there's, you know, that synergy all the way across, um, within the retail galleries, you know, or retail mm -hmm. stores, uh, JMM calls them retail galleries. Other people would call them, you know, their brick and mortar at their store. Yes. The staff in those spaces, you know, also speak the same language and, and have that level of like experience, expertise and expectation uh, that, you know, the largest store, the e-commerce store, which is the most, you know, crowd facing 
has. So everything from like the feel of the website, the the way that, you know, he chooses to shoot the images and the product, it all should, or at least, you know, in that case, should kind of like elicit this fe- a feeling. Um, and I think brands who get it do it very well. And that that could be from, you know, a, a luxury space like JMM or, you know, Gucci or Louis Vuitton or to, to an incredible like beverage coffee brands like a blue bottle, which mm-hmm. you know, I think they've, they've done an incredible job at protecting their brand as well. And, you know, kind of growing organically. I think it doesn't matter where I am. I, I love blue bottle, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Great coffee. Um, <laughs> But I always know what I'm going to get. I know what kind of service I'm going to get. I know, I know, you know that that the uh, the product is going to be the same everywhere. Whether I'm ordering it from their e-commerce or I'm going into, you know, their Abbott Kinney Cafe. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So obviously there is a messaging involved, and you mentioned there is one guy like Andrew is responsible for doing that from since inception. Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah. So th- and this is one aspect. The other aspect is obviously the design and the look and feel. And yeah. so how do you take and how often do you change the UI UX part? Of, I mean, are you getting feedbacks and immediately change, or you have your own methodology, your your own journey that you like consumers to be part of, or is it like an interactive process with consumers, or just one out from your side? With regard to like website aesthetic, yeah, the website, the journeys in the website, the UI UX side of things, yeah, yeah, you know, I think with the redesign, it was really about flow and kind of energy of the site, and mm-hmm. you know, having people, you know, discover the brand um, or experience it. You know, the the homepage isn't a typical homepage; it's a headless website. You know, meaning that like the, you know, the, the front end is very customized and then our, the, the yeah. back end is a Shopify platform. Mm-hmm. Um, but movement was really important. Um, you know, measuring how a customer uh, is using the website is really important to, you know, conversion and time on site. Um, but thinking about their journey as one is building it or the content that is being put on the website is really what's important. And the best way to do that is to study the data and the analytics Mm -hmm. um, using heat maps, seeing where, you know, a customer is falling off the site or where Mm -hmm. they're clicking through and taking note of all of those things, because that's what's going to drive that business forward and, you know, take a, a, a one-time customer to a repeat customer, which is yes. really, uh, you know, a brand's goal, right? You want, you want them to fall in love with you. You want them to have a great experience, whether they're on a website or, you know, a social media platform, um, getting, you know, newsletters that are carefully crafted Um thinking about where you want to drive them to on the website. If you're launching a product, uh, you know, are you driving them to the homepage or driving them to uh, new, you know, releases? Are you driving them to bestsellers? Um, And then what's their journey beyond that? So I think, um, you know, really kind of like thinking about, thinking about them and how they're using the website is really, you know, vital to to a business in e-commerce yes and how do you obviously we are currently in an age post-pandemic where acquisition is so difficult right and retention everyone talks about retention retention there is a new wave of retention titles like the list is very very long and new job description are written around retention right completely yeah 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 so (laughs) what are how do you see this uh, working these days? And I mean, where is the focus? Is it towards how do you acquire new customers? How do you retain existing customers? What are the, some of the strategies that you have in place? Acquisition, you know, there's different. If I look at my experience and I think about like 
the different kinds of brands that I've been at, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was at Forever 21 for almost four years, and that's fast fashion. And that is, you know, customer acquisition is run differently, you know, there from maybe a space that's a contemporary or young designer price point, and then you have a luxury price point. And acquisition to me is, yes, it's important. Yes, it's expensive. But, you know, it's what happens after the initial acquisition. You know, that's that's where the, the retention comes okay, in. Sure. And that's when people start talking about customer lifetime value mm-hmm. and what that means to, you know, your bottom line. My first mentor, her name was Sari Asher. I will, Sari taught me, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Wow. <laughs> nice. And um, on how much you make, how much you keep. Yeah, it's like the, the difference between cash flow and free cash flow, right? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, completely, right? So yeah. you're talking about like, you're, like you're, nice. you have like your gross revenue and you have your net revenue. And a business really, their their worth is going to be run off of what they're keeping. So yes, of course, some people look at it at what how much their top line is driving, but really, you know, a value is what's left at the end of the day. And that to me is a lot like digital marketing. Like I, that's how I think about it. I think about what is this customer? Are they coming back? How do we make them come back? And after the initial, you know, visit to site, like, how are we dating them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what is that, sure. what does that journey look like? Like we can't physically take them to dinner, but you know, how can we, you know, follow up? Um, it's not necessarily like, I, I don't like when a brand bombards me with emails, um, you know, You left this in your cart. Yes, you know, the abandoned cart email flow works sometimes, but that's only, I think that's the most effective in spaces with maybe a a lower AOV, like, you know, that average order value. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a luxury brand. I don't really know if that, that customer is like opening that email going, oh my gosh, I need to, you know, I need to hurry up and go back and buy this. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes that works, you know, like we we did see some conversion through that tactic at JMM, but I wouldn't say that, you know, maybe maybe it worked there because it's limited edition. Yes. Right? Yeah. It doesn't really work on like a repeat customer because they know the brand and they understand it. But Really, you know, it's loyalty programs. It, you know, I think even the most uh, savvy customer or or wh- whether you're talking about a fast fashion customer or a luxury customer, they want to feel special. They want to feel like their their loyalty to the brand matters. And if they if they do feel that way, then, you know, they're likely to be that repeat customer instead of the one-time customer where that cost of acquisition just continues to go up and up and up and up, you know, there's one brand I, I was talking to and they're in the fitness space and they have a product that has a lifetime warranty. Well, when you have a lifetime warranty, what's your repeat customer base look like? Well, yeah. Right. So unless there's a different product offering outside of their main product, then that customer doesn't have a reason to come back because, you know, their, you know, product X is going to last a lifetime. Yeah. And, and so it's thinking about like, if we're doing this really, really well, what, how, you know, what kind of product can we layer onto, you know, product X and build out like Y and Z and, you know, keep going, um, and it, but really doing it like thoughtfully and intentionally and not jumping from, you know, a pair of really beautiful handmade frames to luggage. Yes. Like that doesn't make sense. But that I doesn't think, make sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I like what made really amazing 
sense. And also that customer journey is if, you know, JMM has huge collectors. There are people with, you know, 50, 60, 70 frames. So if they are, if they want to continue to purchase there, you know, what else is going to be limited edition and really special and really amazing. And every time they're going to put it on, they're going to just feel, you know, that luxury and the exceptional quality and be really proud to, to, you know, wear that item. Um, And and that's where, you know, his jewelry came in because it coordinates. It's, you know, he's very inspired by art deco and, you know, there's all art deco, you know, designs that are, are, are all part of, of that jewelry journey. Yes, and that makes a lot of sense, right? And so I'm very, very interested in the persona. I mean, who is buying? What are the characteristics, demographics? Who is buying the product? How how the you know time to purchase or customer journey looks like? Well, I think you know, I think of I think of the data and the analytics. You know, when I when I go here hmm. because I I think of you know male versus female ratio, and I think about you know, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to, you know, all the Google analytics that gets spit out and, and who's on the website. You know, I think, you know, initially a brand like JMM, um, you know, launched with a kind of a masculine feel, but has intentionally uh, put a more um, like female voice to the brand too, with regards to special women's collections and, Mm -hmm. you know, choices of models or campaigns that are shot and put out through the digital space. Um, And that customer, if I think about like building a campaign, what are, what are they, (laughs) you know, it's usually like luxury cars, luxury watches, um, their, you know, real estate businesses, uh, you know, business owners, entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. um, I think, but, you know, you, you kind of have that luxury customer that you can build out, uh, from a digital marketing perspective. And yes, they are a luxury customer, but also, um, there's aspirational customers too. Right. And maybe one pair of JMMs or one luxury, um, you know, handbag is, you know, that's their big purchase. And then they're part of that community mm-hmm. and they're part of that brand. And, you know, a one-time customer is just as important as a repeat customer, even because they're a customer and they're a fan. And if they have a great experience, then they're going to move forward and they're going to talk about their great experience. And that's the best way to also grow a brand. Yes. You know, I think, yeah, I can't remember like the statistic specifically, but let's just say, you know, if a person has a really bad experience, they're going to tell 10 people. But if they have a good experience, they're going to tell one to two people. Um, So making sure the touch points and, and, the experience of the customer is aligned across, you know, e-commerce, social media, you know, uh, newsletters that are being sent out. And within the retail spaces is really important because, you know, you you don't know when they're going to convert, you know, luxury customer is going to take a little longer to convert than a, you know, a fast fashion customer. Yeah, sure. And what do you find? You find that most of the shoppers or visitors are coming from a word of mouth or they know the brand and they're looking for product or just they see, they saw an ad and direct them to the, to the platform. What are the, yeah, how do you I generate think, traffic? Yeah, I think with JMM, it was, you know, two years ago when I, I had started with the company, I think it was very word of mouth because they did almost no marketing at all. Wow. It was wholesale okay. and it was word of mouth and it was intentional, you know, maintaining that, that sense of luxury and uh, limited edition mystery. If you knew the brand, you knew the brand. If you didn't, you didn't, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, the name isn't on the outside of the frames. It's like very beautifully 
um, okay. you know, put on the inside of the frame in, in gold or silver. And that was intentional uh, because that's how he wanted to grow. And then, um, you know, the growth, the growth without any marketing was amazing. And yeah. then when we did start to put marketing dollars behind it, and there was a lot of celebrities that, you know, knew the brand. There was, you know, celebrities, athletes, Formula One drivers. Um, mm-hmm. When they, you know, there was movie placements, TV placements where, you know, the product wasn't gifted. You know, people were people were buying it organically. Yeah. And then all of those things kind of drive people to the site. And I think, you know, the partnerships and collaborations that, Jerome has chosen to have, um, have, have also, uh, driven customers, um, and popularity, um, you know, a Stanley Kubrick collaboration or, uh, you know, and a lot of brands do this too, you know, the collaborations will bring fans of both sides together. And then mm-hmm. that helps, you know, fill the customer funnel, um, in an intentional way. And then those customers, if the collaboration is right, will be, re- will be a repeat customer with the brand. Yeah. You know, if it's, if it's not a, if, if it's not a collaboration that makes sense to the brand, then it's, it doesn't work. It's pointless. Then, you know, it was a bad decision. Yes. Yes. No, today also it's an amazing organic, you know, activity, but again, it should be the right match, right? Otherwise it doesn't make sense. So you mentioned some of the shoppers and the ages seems to me that, you know, that we have Gen Z's also as a customers uh-huh. and consumers and Gen Z's are now becoming like a major part of the acquisition or the purchasing side. I think representing more than 30, 30% already from the total shoppers. And obviously we are hiring also Gen Z, right? Or a team. So this probably a way for us to adapt, to change, to learn. I guess there are a lot of things that are happening during this process that are maybe challenging and requires uh, more adaptations and learnings, right? It does. And... <laughs> I think adaptations is the operative term here yeah. <laughs> because um, it's a di- dinner. Or it's all a, a sorry, d- different, uh, different perspectives. And you look at millennial, you look at Gen Z, you look at Gen X, like all three of those generations are in the workplace. Now um, there's really funny memes and, and like videos on, on TikTok about the differences uh, in how they work where, you know, a manager might, you know, email in and say, I need you to do this. And the Gen X is like, oh, okay, let me mute, mute my phone and, you know, let, <laughs> let me get this done real quick. Or, you know, oh, I got to take this. And, you know, they're, they're quickly just getting it done. And then yeah. you know, a millennial is going to be like a little bit more, you know, they're a little, I feel like they're, they're more, <laughs> I don't want to say thoughtful, but, but, you know, they, they handle the task in a different way where a Gen Z is like, this is outside of the work time. Like this is, this is wow, encroaching yeah. on my personal space and my personal time. And so there, it, then my work life balance is off. Is off. And it wasn't part of the job description you shared with right, me right, 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 18 yeah. months ago. <laughs> yeah. This is my job description. Yeah. Um, where Gen X will be like, okay, well, I guess it wasn't in my job description, but it needs to be done. And so I'll just lean in and do it. And I think yeah. there's some part of the millennials too that will do that. But but Gen Z, somewhere along the line, has been taught that it's not in their job description. And they do want that clarity. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't blame them. Like, it's okay to want the clarity. But... Also just like the interviewing process and like how they interview and the questions they ask or, you know, I, I had one person that I was hiring for a position and, 
you know, she, we made it through, you know, three interview process. And then she said, can I come shadow you at the office? Um, just to make sure that I feel good in the culture and, you know, it like, it, it resonates with me yeah. and, and, you know, we talked about it, uh, senior leadership and we were kind of like, that's not a great sign. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great sign for us. Something is wrong with us, probably. You know? oh, there, yeah. we all like things yeah. or something one day, and then maybe you're going to be like, I don't know, I'm feeling a little animosity in the office, and it's like, yeah. you know, disturbing my my chi, and I need to take a day off. Something with the vibes here is not uh, right. Yeah, the vibes are all off. Are off. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, I I was reading the other day, and they said. 55% of Gen Z's ask about a company's, you know, um, the company's uh, culture, their lifestyle, you know, what, what their work life and lifestyle is going to look like. But in addition to that, they're also asking about what is the brand's environmental impact? What is their diversity inclusion look inclusion, like? Yeah. You know, and do they have any social justice policies um, in place? And I feel like that is a very amazing perspective when going into a company. I think it's I think it's really healthy um, because brands should be concerned with all of those things. And if over half of Gen Z of the Gen Z workforce is asking these kind of questions, yes, you know, and you know, imagine what that's going to look like. And I'm kind of pivoting a little bit here, but but what that's going to look like as they continue to grow as shoppers and purchasers and the brands that they're going to align with and become the repeat purchasers of those brands. And what are those brands doing in order to uh, become better Yes, you know, better, better impact on our world, better impact on, you know, diversity, inclusion, um, social practices. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think that there's something to say about that perspective. Yes. I think, um, from a management point of view, I've had to learn to uh, improve my soft skills. <laughs> As one says, um, okay. in order to manage millennial and, you know, Gen Z, um, because it's like when I enter the workforce, you know, I, I'm Gen X, but I'm like, I'm let, I'm a younger Gen X. So I, I understand like when the millennials came in, they wanted a seat at the table. You know, they wanted the transparency, they want to learn, they want to, and I think, and I share that a hundred percent in, in, you know, Gen Z is even like above and beyond that. They, I don't want to get myself into too much trouble here, but I do think that a person needs to earn their stripes and learn yes. in the way, because with, you know, they might think a task or, you know, something I ask them to do is. I can't believe she's asking me to do this, but there's a reason I'm asking them to do it. And it's usually to learn something and so that they can build on their skill sets, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, if somebody goes to college and, you know, studies whatever business and then immediately gets their MBA without any work experience and comes into a company thinking that they can do the job of their boss, that's not necessarily the true because they don't have the business acumen um, yet, but it doesn't mean they're not going to be a fast learner or yes. maybe do it in half the time with the way that technology is and, and the expectations of that generation coming into the, to the workplace because they are very kind of in your face about learning and transparency. Yes, I mean, I fully agree. They are very social, social sensitive. Um, diversity, inclusion is very, very important for them. They don't like too much power in the same place. So, like, 
Yeah. They are uh, running away from Amazon, for example, and they're looking for alternatives. That's another yeah. important thing, for example. Um, and, I, and I know that they are changing jobs in a very, very quick, quick, uh, quick, yeah. quick, quick, Year, quick update. And 18 eight. months, 20 months, whatever is the average right now, because they, they are developing their own skill set, which is good for them and will take them to the next level. But they also respect their there is a time that they need to relax and not to work. And like this work-life balance is something that comes natural for them. Maybe because also, you know, they grew up with a f- iPhone in their hands, right? So they, they need, it's, it's, I think it's a different thing that we need to we need to understand. And it's also, I, they, got, they get hired not only from like really data-driven success stories, right? I raised this and this uh, number of, uh, I raised the conversion rates or increased sales or whatever. It's a lot of soft skills and capabilities that uh, that are important in hiring today. And I hear a lot of, let's call them Gen Xs, like the dinosaurs, right? So they, they are like, I, I got hired because I'm amazing and I'm like I'm a Six Sigma expert and I'm operationally, <laughs> operationally, you know, savvy, and I know how to do things, but fine. It, right now, it used to be 100% important, but now it's 50% important, right? Yeah. You need to have others, other skills that, uh, that you need to possess, right? So obviously, it, it's, it, it, you said it, it's encourage you to, up, to, to look at your management skills, obviously, and update your soft skills and, and all that. So that, that's, I think, a process that... Um, we all need to do, right? That's uh, yeah. definitely the case. And can you give maybe an example or what do you mean by soft skills? Well, I think, you know, empathy and compassion mm-hmm. um, are are two things that, you know, I, I kind of, I think when I started my career would leave at the lease line before I came into work um, mm-hmm. because it was, you know, put my head down and drive forward. Um, But then I had to learn to lift my head up in order to be a better manager and to build relationships with my team on a personal level, not like, you know, you're sharing your deepest, darkest secrets with them, but also creating space for them to, you know, come to you, to, in this case, me, uh, and say, Hey, uh, you know, I've got this going on and, you know, uh, I need a day off or can I leave early because of, you know, I have this personal thing or, um, and me noticing when somebody's a little bit off their game or they look sad or they look stressed and had taking space and having that one-on-one with them and saying, you know, do you have too much on your plate? Do you need help? Do we mm-hmm. need to, you know, reorganize for you? And when I was at, I would say my, my time at Forever 21 really helped me kind of grow in that way too, where you know, I had a really large team there. I, there was, you know, about 26 people and, and I had slowly built that up, that business up. And there, there were a lot of times where, you know, somebody was afraid to come to me because I'm such a driver. And then when I did lift my head and start looking and started looking at people and, and, being more compassionate, a compassionate leader, I could, I could have those conversations. I remember with my production team once it was, you know, I didn't realize that, you know, one person had like a significant amount of skews that they were trying to do the production for. And so we all met and then we rebalanced things and then everybody was happier or you yeah. know, anything like that that's going on in the team. Yeah. But but um, creating that space is really important, and um, I think I think I think somebody now needs to know that there is an open door policy. You know, I 
Mrs. Chang, who was the founder at that at the time of, you know, uh, at Forever Twenty One, during that time when I was there, she had an open door policy. Mm-hmm. There were like over a thousand people in you wow. know our headquarters, and I could just walk into her office at any time and say, "Hey, I'm having a problem with this, or I'm making, you know, can you help me with this?" And she would just stop and look up. And if somebody with that kind of power and um, and the intense work day can just stop for a minute, it makes all the difference. And then it taught me to stop and it taught me to listen and it taught me to not be distracted when somebody came and asked me a question to be a better yeah. listener. Yeah. So actually, we are still in a industry which is data driven results growth profitability nothing has changed on that respect right right but I guess the the way to achieve those targets maybe has evolved right a hundred percent that's uh, that's the idea we are not uh, saying we are less uh, ambitious or we have less uh, demands from ourselves and from the company and from the result but we probably need to learn how to do it in a different way which is more maybe a better way so I think yeah. we're used to, and, and in that respect, I think it's important for me to hear a perspective of you know, how you see AI comes into this picture, right? Because AI is also, from one side, can changing the future of work, right, and mm-hmm. staffing. It also helps you know, expedite a lot of things. Probably, you know, encourage companies to become more. Uh, software oriented or tech oriented what what are your thoughts about ai in e-commerce i think it's an essential part of e-commerce uh, mm-hmm. i think um i think people should be embracing it fully uh if they're not already um it's evolving faster than uh than anything i've ever seen um, we are, we are in a place where like, if somebody is building an e-commerce site, one of the first questions they should be asking as they start to integrate at, uh, software is, you know, how is this company, uh, em- you know, how, how are they embracing AI? How are they integrating AI? How can their AI tools help you know, the e-commerce company um, grow. Um, and, you know, I think of a, when I think of AI, I think of uh, not just like data analytics, but I think of personalization and personalization and retention mm-hmm. because, you know, retention is, you know, that there's that word again. It's, uh, yes. it's I told you it's coming from all over. <laughs> 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 totally. I just had somebody ask me to do a project for them where I was, uh, you know, they said, go through, go through our platform and, you know, uh, our tech stack and see what we can be optimizing and or change in order to um, integrate AI more. And, but the end result being improving uh, CLTV. So, you know, and all of that goes mm-hmm. then back down to your, you know, net contribution margins. Um, Got it. You yeah. know, there's, I, I mean, I use, I use chat GPT all the time. Um, I think there's pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if somebody is in, you know, elementary school through high school, uh, leaning on AI to, you know, help them do things my fear is that it's going to take away critical thought um, because it's very easy to, you know, oh, you know, hey, I, I need to write a, a thank you to so and so for X, you know, Y and Z, and and like within a second or two seconds, you know, there's a beautifully written email yes. or letter. And then, you know, now there's a humanized GPT, which I actually am not that impressed with. That's supposed to kind of take away any of the sound, like sounds of, you know, that AI wrote, whatever it is. But I I don't really think it works that well. Okay. Um, And then, you know, again, there's, 
uh, like search software, like uh, companies like Algolia that have really great, you know, AI technologies from a personalization standpoint. Mm -hmm. There are, um, there's, you know, I'll be anxious to see uh, what Microsoft is going to look like once all of their AI is completely rolled out and what that's going to do to, you know, yeah. Excel, Google Sheets, um, from that kind of number crunching standpoint. Um, there's companies out there that, you know, finance departments and CFOs can use right now in order to pull together their data and organize reporting, finance reporting. Um, you know, it's like, of course, there's BI solutions out there, but, you know, everybody kind of has a BI solution. But really, like, how are companies going to take this and kind of pull that into their own ethos? And is that going to take away jobs? That's a big fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now, probably not. But I think when hiring, uh, one of the things that, you know, I'm going to be asking is, is what's your familiarity with AI? Are you using it? Have you used it before? Um, and I will probably opt for the person who is using AI and is excited about it versus not. Yeah. And I, I, I think like from e-commerce, I don't want to speak for other, you know, industries, but I'm a hundred percent going to ask somebody about whether or not they're passionate about AI yes. and if they're, you know, using it and how are they using it and, you know, how would they use it uh, if they were to, you know, get a position as a, you know, e-commerce analyst or whatever. Yes. About AI, I have also an interest, interesting questions for you. Okay. So when do you think we will see the first, one billion dollar valuation company operated by one employee or one founder. I oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> That's such a good. No, it's okay. No one knows. Give me your best guess. <laughs> one business, one founder, one billion dollars. I mean, I think it depends on what it is, right? Do they like? Is it... I guess they're using a lot of AI tools. <laughs> they're using a lot of AI tools. What does that look like? Um, By the way, it's not a dream. There are a lot of founders that are already operating and selling tens of millions of dollars. But I'm asking about that $1 billion figure. I mean, I almost feel like it would end up being in the medical field. Wow. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, I don't know what it is yet, but I think... Timing. Time. 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 Okay. It's 2024. I would say by 2030. 2030. Six years. Okay. Depending okay. on what it is. Like, I really yes. want to say 10 years, but I'm saying like. <laughs> yes. Because this is moving so fast, but it's really going to come down to what yes. is it that they're selling, what is the product, and how scalable is it, right? So Correct. I think about scalability um, mm -hmm. and consistency of quality. And, and, you know, really it's like the operations and logistics behind it. So I, I don't know, is it cloud-based? Is it, you know, I think of like radiology and what AI is going to do to re radiology. And then I think of the radiologists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Like if, if, a, if AI, I, I don't know, I, I think it's somewhere in the medical field. Okay. Abigail, great. What what are you proud of in your career? Yeah, I was talking to someone recently and they said, what are you most proud of? They kind of asked me the same question. And I said, mm. I hope I haven't experienced it yet. I wow. hope it's yet to come. Nice. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I really do. Very creative. Nice one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And also, this is the part where I ask you about a fun fact about yourself. Yes, fun facts. Well, you also said, what's the fun fact that nobody knows about you? Exactly. Um, because you I can, hire. Right. I can tell you, like, the fun facts, um, you know, hobbies, kind of those kind of things that I like to do. 
Um, I love reading, right? And so after being in this in, in the fashion industry for so long and starting my career working in like brick and mortar to, you know, working in vertical fashion and like may actually making and designing and working with teams to e-commerce. I I thought and 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 having these conversations with all of my friends who've been in this industry forever. Mm-hmm. It's such a crazy ride. And there's so many people that we've all experienced who some of them great, some of them super not great, some of them um, straight out of like a movie yeah. where like you wouldn't even believe the stories of like one founder I worked for who used to like kick boxes and you know, throw things off of shelves and and yell at buyers and say, you're lucky you have a job. The unemployment line is so long. And he was just so abusive. And like, we laugh about it now, but during the time it was really horrible. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But, you know, I, I sat down one day and said, why am I in this industry? Like, why, why am I doing this to myself on a daily basis? (laughs) And I think, and then I brought that up to a couple of friends and they're like, I know, why do we do this to ourselves? And then we kind of talked about like our upbringings and like our families and the experiences maybe we had as like, you know, children and, and what kind of person does it take and where do they have to come from in order to stay in this business for 20 years? Hmm. And so I started writing it down and I started writing down my experiences and in fashion, wow. but kind of tying them into upbringing or what that looks like. You know, my mom's side <clears throat> is Italian. And so they're they're loud and, you know, they're yelling all the time and everything <laughs> passionate. And, you know, my dad's side is um, a Syrian and Irish and, you know, there's, there's like passion there too, but it's kind of like done at a different level, <laughs> um, <laughs> but there's a lot of kind of intensity and drive there and a lot, you know, there, and there's a ton of love on both sides. Right. So, it's, you know, looking at all of those things and childhood experiences and saying, like, why would I stay at a place where there's so much chaos and, and the founder is just like, you know, one minute he's like, you're you're amazing. And then the next minute, he, you know, you look over and he's like throwing stuff off a shelf on top of a, a you know, a young woman trying to merchandise a store or working you know, seven days a week, 12 hours a day and being on salary and, you know, where does that work ethic comes from? And, you know, having two parents who worked really, really hard and having them as examples and, you know, never knowing. uh, And I I think that's where like putting the head down comes from, right? Mm -hmm. Different generation. Yes. And then, you know, having to learn how to soften my skills but I'm writing, I'm writing all of that down now and writing a book. Wow. So do, do I hear a book is coming? Is, uh, um, I, don't know when, I don't know when it's coming, but I am, I have been slowly writing it. Wow. So this is a, probably an official announcement here? Uh, yeah. I think wow. Maybe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now you're putting pressure on me. <laughs> you know, a public uh, announcement is a different level of commitment, yes. right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it is something that, like, I thought about for a long time, and you know, it's like it's not not from like you know the devil wears Prada fashion perspective, but really kind of tying having like a, a human element to it, and and thinking about what is it about the craziness and the chaos that would draw somebody to this business. Um, A lot of people will talk to me, you know, younger women or men and say like, oh, this, it must be so amazing. And isn't it cool that you're in fashion and, you know, every, anybody who's been in it for like 10 or 15 more years, you kind of just look at them and go, you have no idea. Like it's such a short, 
Yeah. <laughs> But it looks very nice from outside, right? But yeah, it's like <laughs> peak, once you like peek behind the curtain, yes. you know, yes. it can be a huge disaster. But there's also something in my DNA that makes me love it and makes me want to nice. be involved and passionate about the industry. Great. I'm looking forward for the first release. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> not saying, not putting any pressure, but I hope it'll be this year. <laughs> <laughs> wow great uh abigail anything you want to add oh i mean no i mean i think you know i'm excited to see where this business and and this industry is going i'm excited you know to see the evolution of it and one of the things that i do love right now uh as a consumer is seeing uh, brands, global brands coming into the United States and mm -hmm. um, kind of disrupting here. I, I think that that's important. Um, I think it's fresh. Uh, uh, I look forward to kind of the, the global footprint more domestically. Mm -hmm. um, I think it'll, it'll, uh, help U.S. fashion evolve a little bit more and stay on their toes some um, because I think some brands are a little comfortable, um, you know, just seeing, reading about uh, Nike reorganizing and um, that they're cutting, you know, two billion off of uh, their expenses uh, in order to reorganize their company because, you know, they've seen losses and, mm -hmm. you know, European brands in, in shoe wear and active coming in and um, disrupting a behemoth like that to where they're taking note, I, I think is really interesting too. Um, interesting. Yeah, I look forward to seeing where the business goes. Great. So probably it's a good summary. I uh, really appreciate the time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Really a pleasure. Very, very fun. Very fun. Bye-bye, Abigail. Bye. See you soon. Okay, sounds good. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, Consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I dot net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.